Um, our speaker today is Dr. David Song. Uh, Dr. Song is the Cynthia Chow Professor of Surgery, the Vice Chair of the Department of Surgery, the Chief of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery. In addition, uh, Dr. Song is the Associate Dean for Continuing Medical Education here at the University. David is an internationally recognized expert in plastic surgery with additional training in reconstructive microsurgery. He specializes in breast reconstruction and oncoplastic surgery. Dr. Song has pioneered several techniques for the repair and reconstruction of chest wall defects and has been involved in clinical trials relating to these procedures. For his outstanding achievements in 2008, Dr. Song received the prestigious Arthur G. Michelle Award from the Breast Cancer Network of Strength. Cranes Chicago also awarded Dr. Song the 40 Under 40 Executive Recognition. Additionally, Dr. Song serves on the board of Medical Aid for Children of Latin America, an organization that provides free surgical care for children with congenital deformities. Dr. Song received his MD from the University of California at Los Angeles, his MBA from the University of Chicago Booth School of Business, and completed his residency at the University of Chicago. Today, Dr. Song will speak to us on the topic, the future of surgery under the ACA. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. David Song. It's always great to talk about the future because there's no data. <laughs> and uh, I'm, used to not, I'm not used to giving talks without having firm data that's scientifically uh, rigorous, that's been tried and tested. So this is sort of a, a little bit outside my element. So indulge me uh, for the next 45 minutes on what I think the future of surgery under the Affordable Care Act will look like. <clears throat> Some controversial topics in here. These are based on my musings over the last four years, uh, a lot of discussions with my uh, economist friends that I golf with every Saturday, uh, including the likes of uh, Gene Fama and Steve Levitt. So uh, some of these ideas have been bounced around on the golf course for the last four years. And so uh, hopefully it'll come to fruition. So there is some validity. It's not just my own uh, imaginations. Here are my disclosures. And I do want to also say that my views expressed are not necessarily shared by those of uh, the Department of Surgery, the Dean's Office, or the Administration or the Hospital. I want to make that very clear. I'm going to go over a few things, uh, really talk about the state of confusion and transition currently, um, talk about price transparency and what that means and how that's coming about and how that will affect us, uh, talk about cost control on an individual surgeon level. And then talk a little bit about how surgery and medicine may be organized in the near future or should be organized. And then finally, talk a little bit about uh, some of the work that Alex Langerman uh, and we are doing in uh, Oak Ridge. So if you look at the left, everyone look at Obamacare and say, this is wonderful. It is really, how could a first world nation not have coverage for our uh, populace? But if you look on the right side, you get a completely different view of what the Affordable Care Act looks like. I want to make it very clear that I don't want this talk to be political. It's just a matter of presenting ideas and what I think will be crystallized into how surgery will be performed in the future. <clears throat> this is a funny thing. There's a lot of confusion here. And I think even at the governmental level, there's confusion as to what's going on. And so uh, this is a, a slide that, that uh, somewhat, somewhat resonates. And I think the state of confusion and the fog of confusion is starting to dissipate. <clears throat> so how, are, how is surgery done today? Well, if you come to the University of Chicago and you have breast reconstruction sur surgery by me or one of my colleagues, there's a bill. And this in entire bill that is paid for by your third party ca carrier is divided up into the institutional side, what the insurance company pays the University of Chicago, for the ICU care, for the ORs, for the nurses, <coughs> for the sutures and such. Then there's a professional side of what we as surgeons get paid. Of course, if you talk to surgeons, this side is 
too small, and if you talk to the institution, this side's too small, and if you talk to third-party payers, that side's way too big. And so there's this dynamic conflict that's going on currently. So what's happening now is that CMS is shifting the risk away from the hospitals and to the doctors and physicians. So 10, 15 years ago, I didn't have to think about this stuff. I just walked into work and did the surgery and used the stuff that I wanted to use and didn't need to think about how our outcomes are going to be or what is quality. And that's something that's changing rapidly. So uh, this is a, a slide that if you remember nothing else, hopefully you remember this slide. It's like crossing the crevasse. Currently, we're over here. Right now, the more I do as a surgeon, the more I get paid. The more surgical uh, procedures that I do, the more remuneration that we receive at, as a hospital. It's tied to our work RVUs, and I'm seeing Andy Switek over there, who we are very, uh, very aligned here <clears throat> in 2014. There are a few quality measures. Now, Inisquip's coming about, and there's all kinds of things that are starting to blossom. You know, even plastic surgery has its own registry. Uh, but because of that, there's an incentive to do more. Meaning that when a patient comes to see me, the first thing on my mind is, when can I schedule the patient for surgery? And I realize when I take a step back and think about this as not just an economist, but as a human being, that perhaps not everyone needs surgery. And so what happens is that the remuneration that we receive in the high-end top growth service lines helps to cross-subsidize the entire medical center in many ways. In the future, with the Affordable Care Act is going to accelerate and the ve velocity of this acceleration is going to increase now and, and tomorrow, is it's all about population care, which helps to reduce fragmentation. EMR in many ways is is going to, in 10 years, tell us what's efficient, what's working, and what doesn't work. And that's perhaps how it's going to save over $19 billion a year. Uh, there's going to be a premium on quality. And quality measures are really going to be at the forefront of everyone's mind. I'm going to talk a little bit about that towards the end of my talk. <clears throat> and then government payers are going to take a prominent role, thus incentivizing not the realm of do more, get paid more, but perhaps doing less to create better health and value for the population that we take care of. And that's going to be accelerated. And I don't know if you can see that from back there, but by bundled payments and this whole concept of pay for performance is really going to help to accelerate our crossage of this crevasse. Uh, this is another busy slide, but I want you to focus right here. Currently, there's a whole set of employers now that are self-insured, and, and that is rising. And so what's happening is, Large companies like Walmart, school systems, Lowe's, McDonald's are now uh, self-insuring their own population. And so what that does, it sort of flip-flops the incentives that are currently happening and perhaps realigns them with global health of their population. What does that mean for us as surgeons? Well, that means that perhaps, and this is a bit controversial, insurance companies will no longer be needed. What if Walmart came to the University of Chicago and said, uh, dear Dean Polanski, we want to make sure that University of Chicago is our preferred provider for X, Y, and Z service lines, and we will negotiate with you directly because we're basically paying it. Uh, and then Blue Cross can just be the third party adjudicator of that process. <clears throat> Novel concept. This is sort of a back to the future of the 50s and 60s where uh, patients paid for the services that they received. What does that do? And I think. Over the last three or four decades, insurance companies and the whole idea and the concept of insurance has been perverted. You know, uh, if you think about car insurance, there's all types of different uh, products that you can buy, and health insurance is the same way. And so when someone else pays for your insurance, the person that's not paying doesn't own it. And so what happens is it's similar to going and leasing a car for a week. If uh, Andy Switek and I are going on a golf trip and I'm leasing a car, well, I'm not going to care if he spills coffee on the seat. But believe me, if he was in my car and I'm driving to our golf retreat in my car, I'm going to be really upset that he spilled coffee. Sim similar with healthcare. When a self insured entity pays for their workers to have health care, I think that you're going to start to see alignment of both health population management and this whole concept of value-based healthcare delivery. So the whole, the whole purpose of this slide is to show you that's happening currently and the velocities of that are, uh, is, is increasing. So let me segue into tr price transparency. And I think if you think about 
price transparency in terms of Hotels.com, Priceline.com, Geico, and Nationwide Insurance. You go on to uh, insurance website or you go on to, if, you, if you're flying to uh, Hawaii for a, for a holiday, you can go in and, and punch in your dates and, and out spits kayaks, you know, five different choices. Well, we don't have that in healthcare. And if you think about all the industries that occur in the United States, uh, some of these efficiencies that leverage technology that uh, help to make things more efficient and unveil price obfuscations just don't exist in healthcare. And I, I think we're on a we're at the dawn of a new age of price transparency within healthcare. And let me talk a little bit about that. <clears throat> these are funny slides, but they have a lot of meaning because when you go and get your hip replaced at University of Chicago versus Northwestern versus Rush or UIC the hospital bill is completely disparate. And I'll show you some data here. This is a California study just on routine appendectomies. People have seen this before. But if you go to one hospital, it's as low as $1,500, all in. If you go to another hospital, it's as high as $182,000. Why? The reason why is because they can. And I'll tell you what happens when you start to reveal and peel the onion away, the layers of the onion away from price obfuscation uh, there are going to be some winners and losers, in, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Here's another study showing that not just appendectomies, but cabbages at different hospitals in California have such a disparate way of charging and pricing for what they do. <clears throat> More data in the, in the Pittsburgh area showing that no matter what you charge, the payments aren't too disparate. And I think if you look at the Chicagoland area, um, and God forbid one of you or your family members requires heart surgery, well, if you came to the University of Chicago versus Rush versus Northwestern, you would see a dramatic difference uh, in, the, in the price of what you're paying for, what the charge is to the insurance company. So we're on a dawn of a new era where I think companies like Castlight, just as a quick show of hands, who in this room has heard of Castlight? Raise your hand. Okay, stay tuned because these type of companies where they're collecting all types of um, health care bills and revealing what people pay for is the first step towards price transparency and is really the first wave of the Priceline.coms or the Kayaks, if you will, of healthcare. So what that does is, let's say you live in this zip code and you want uh, a primary care physician or you have a sore throat or you need a colonoscopy, you'll type in your zip code and you'll type in uh, who charges what and how much you'll actually pay for it with your deductible and your current insurance plan. That's an extremely powerful tool because imagine if you needed left toe surgery and your network was narrow uh, and you went on there and said, okay, I have left toe, I need left toe surgery. I can choose between Dr. Chin, Dr. Siegler, or Dr. Song. Well, Dr. Siegler is going to charge $50,000 and Dr. Song charges $2,000 and Dr. Chin charges Two hundred, and if you pair that with outcomes data, that's the next step. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the future. Well, guess what? You're going to raise your hand and say, "What's go what's so special about Dr. Siegler? He's very special to me, but he may not be the best left toe surgeon." Mm -hmm. So this is what Castlight, and they just went public um, about two months ago, and uh, this is a, a complete wave of the future. And as I disclosed, I'm an advisor for Health Engine, which is uh, similarly a vehicle for price transparency but with an added uh, benefit of actually negotiating with providers with their excess capacity to be able to provide uh, quality care at, at, at a lesser price that's totally transparent. So if you think about it as uh, hotels.com for healthcare and things that are high in capacity because if we used 99 percent of our OR time, well this type of vehicle is irrelevant, but if we're at 60 to 65 percent of our capacity, well, there's 35 percent of capacity that can be utilized for a, uh, a less price, a, a contracted price. So think about it in airlines. When you take off from Chicago to Orange County and all the seats except for five are not filled, well, if you, if you, if you actually go on on a Tuesday night after midnight, or I think it's right before midnight, it's the, the cheapest prices because that's when they do inventory. So vehicles like this will, are starting to pop up and I think we are once again on the dawn of a new era of price transparency that we've had in virtually every other services 
uh, in the United States except for healthcare. So with that, price transparency becomes a responsibility of the providers to think about costs. So what does something cost? Well, if you go to uh, Nordstrom's and you want to buy a tie, the person that purchased the tie for Nordstrom's paid a wholesale price to uh, a factory in Malaysia. And the Malaysians paid a, they, you can go down the supply chain and think about exactly what people paid for. But in healthcare, it's extremely confusing. So I did a straw poll because once again, we have no data. Uh, I don't know if maybe most of the people in this room are too young to remember this, but there's a game show called The Price is Right. And I know it's in its different iteration, but one of the favorite games is you put a commodity up there and you had to guess the price between a certain range. And of course, some people were good at it and some people were horrible at it. So I did this with our surgeons and I asked surgeons in the surgical waiting room, hey, Dr. Langman, how much does a surgical staple cost and how much does a 3.0 Vicro cost? And I did this across about 20 different surgeons, and I got answers between $18 and $182. Jason probably knows the exact price, and he can tell me who won or not, but that is the basis for this cost confusion. Because we, as the providers, the consumers of these variable costs, don't even know how much they cost. So what, is that, what happens? It goes back to the analogy of renting a car versus owning a car, and we don't have the accountability on our side as surgeons. This, I promise you this is the only slide I'm going to show from business school, but if you look at the variable costs out here, the higher you go and the more you use, the profit margin goes down and your contribution goes down. And in this era of efficiency and managing expenses and managing price transparency, coupled with cost control, this is extremely important. So how are we going to get there? Well, the vehicle, if you remember back to my slide of that crevasse uh, and the accelerator being bundled payments, this is what's going to happen. Instead of the current situation of pro fees, institutional remuneration, and there's that dynamic conflict, well, there's going to be this whole concept of bundled care where, uh, and this is happening already, and, this, uh, and actually our old dean, Glenn Steele, at Geisinger Health is one of the fir first people to really do this on a systematic basis for co coronary artery bypass grafting. So he went to his third party adjudicators and said, look, we're going to take care of your patients um, with coronary artery disease and we'll take $40,000 all in and we'll, we'll take control of that. What happens there is now the risk is shifted from the insurance carrier to actually the provider and the institution. So how does that work? Well, if there's a complication, the hospital eats it. If there's a uh, mismanagement of variable costs of things that Jason has to buy for our ORs, the hospital eats it. So what happens then is, how is this remuneration going to be doled out to all the different parties involved, from radiology to uh, healthcare services to the support services, nursing, ICU, and so on and so forth. And that's really going to be the, the, the big work that institutions will have to do, I think, in the near future when things are really moving towards bundled care. Because once again, this shift is happening rapidly and the risk of healthcare is now being placed upon the providers and the institutions as opposed to a third party payer. So what happens if to our income? Well, I think as surgeons, we're starting to see government payers uh, pay nine cents on the dollar for what we do. Now let me pause for a moment. There's a few surgeons in the room and I'm going to say something a bit controversial. I think that if you look at and normalize data of surgeons and surgical services, globally that United States, the cost of what we do and the remuneration of what we, what we receive for the same services is markedly higher. We're talking standard deviations higher than our closest neighbors. One of my good friends uh, was skiing in the Dolomites and just this past winter and he went down a double X run and had a tibial plateau fracture. So instead of flying out here and he has the means to fly wherever he wants to go, uh, one of his friends that was skiing with him was a uh, German surgeon that knew uh, some of the Italians that got him into a private clinic, fixed his knee, his tibial plateau for all in $7,500. We're talking including the implant costs, including the hospital stay, which was three days, medicines and surgery. I can tell you the hospital bill for a tibial plateau fracture, probably in the Chicagoland area, all in, 
close to $90,000, anywhere between sixty dollars to $90,000. So what's happening here? And I, I want to save that conflict for our discussion, but unless we do something as surgeons and as leaders within a medical institution, the income will be anticipated on a downward trend. I think we need to figure out what to do with it. This is actually a slide that Jason will, will look at and know, but these are real life ongoing things that we're doing uh, in managing our variable costs. And here's our estimated savings for things like hip and knee, uh, neurofixation, and so forth, and how we're actually being uh, stewards of, of some of these things that are high ticket items. And this is a real slide, and I've taken the offending companies out to, to save them, but you can see for something just like a biologic, which is a skin substitute, the prices can be markedly different. And so uh, this is a real slide. The meeting was set for me in, uh, in mid-December of last year to figure out how to consolidate and pick. Now, we're not asking to pick based on just price alone, but we're looking at pairing price and aligning that with our outcomes. And this is something that we need to do more of and continuing to own as surgeons. Uh, the days of, hey, give me three of those and two of these and let's see what sticks are, are really long gone. So what will be the drivers of efficiency in the future? I think, first and foremost, we have to understand what things cost. As surgeons, like I said, when I did that straw poll, there's a, a huge ver uh, variability of what things cost. If I asked any of you how much does a gallon of gas cost, you can within three to 10 cents know and tell me exactly how much a gallon of gas or a gallon of milk will cost. But in surgery, with things that I use every day multiple times a day, uh, that, that data is not clear. So with that data, by unveiling that data, we as surgeons have to be better at managing our variable costs. Uh, I can't tell you how many times, I'm gonna pause for a moment and give you real life vignettes of what happens in surgery. And uh, these are some of the things that Dr. Langerman is studying in, through Opry and how stress perhaps is correlated with higher use of variable instruments that are disposable. So let me give you an example. Uh, I'm gonna pick on Dr. Angelos because he's always so calm and smooth and collected. But there may be a day when there's some extra bleeding coming out of his incision after doing a thyroidectomy. And the nurse had walked out of the room because she was getting the dressings for Dr. Angelos. Dr. Angelos uncharacteristically gets upset and starts to demand, where's the suction because my suction is not working. And the joke here is that it used to be the only thing that doesn't work, that, that doesn't suck is the suction. Um, <laughs> but now the nurse comes back in with all the things that he wanted for the dressings and Dr. Angelos is yelling and screaming at her, which he never does, uh, where's my suction? I need an extra yank hour because it fell on the ground and I need an extra uh, fiber and sealant and, and hemostatic solution, this little powder that costs hundreds if not thousands of dollars. So she rushes out of the room, oh my gosh. Dr. Angelos is really pissed. I've never seen Dr. Angelos pissed. So instead of grabbing one hemostat, which costs thousands of dollars, she grabs two because she doesn't want him to be upset. And then comes back to the operating table and knows that Dr. Angelos is really upset, opens two of these. Dr. Angelos, meanwhile, while she was out, uh, got control of the bleeding with good surgical technique. Everything is calm and cool. The video is working again and we don't need the surgical statin anymore. So what happens? The nurse did her job, and the nurse is, is trying to please Dr. Angelos, do the right thing for the patient, and opens up things that cost hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, that goes untouched. This happens thousands of times a day, every day in the United States. So we have to figure out how to control that. And I'm gonna show you a real life example of that, and how to partner with hospitals to make sure that the efficiencies of what we do in surgery not only translate into great patient care and safety, but cost effective patient care and safety that really equates to value. So I have this idea that right now there's this whole concept of work RVUs. The more you do, the more it's tied to compensation. But in the future, there may be something called relative cost units and they, you want them to be diametrically opposed to your relative value units, but uh, Andy Switek may have a sheet that opens up and says, Dr. Song's relative value units are, are, are really ticking up, but so is his relative cost units. And we're gonna have to tie that to his compensation. Because what you want is a divergence of 
work units versus cost units. And I think that once you define that inflection point and can normalize that, uh, stay tuned because I really think that this is an opportunity for forward thinking universities and medical centers to trial and think about not just RVUs, but RCUs. And this applies across the spectrum of healthcare delivery, not just in surgery. Surgery just happens to be easy to pick on because we have got high variable costs. So this is a real life picture uh, probably, I don't know, six months ago. I consider myself a very prudent, uh, parsimonious surgeon. And I'm very aware of this. And I'm actually the one giving this talk. But this is quite hypocritical because this is my Remains of the day. This is the title that we, uh, that I came up with, with Alex. And these are all the instruments and things that were opened but not touched at the end of the case. Not just the beginning, at the end of the case. So we're doing a study right now is how much we're actually wasting. You can see here this Vioptics monitor, that's $780, contracted price. This is a, vi this is a specialized glue and surgical tape probably a couple hundred bucks, 120 bucks, something like that. Uh, a couple of staplers, stereo strips, uh, a light mat, which I love to use to give light into deep crevices. That's probably, I don't know, at least 150 bucks. All in total, I think this was about 680 to 700 bucks, something in that ballpark. And that's for someone that, in my opinion, I think I'm very parsimonious. My wife will say that I'm cheap, um, <laughs> but uh, I'd like to use the word parsimonious. And that's me. So think about what happens hundreds if not thousands of times a day, every day in the operating rooms in the United States, which translates into huge opportunity for us to manage proactively how we deliver high quality care, which equates to value. Because we know that the dollars are shrinking, uh, we know that the costs of what we use are increasing, and we have to figure out how we can do it better. And that's why guys like Jason, I'm glad you're here, are going to be pivotal in partnering with us to figure out how to deliver this change management correctly. So I have this concept. At the end of the case, so in surgery, what happens at the beginning of the case, when Dr. Angelos does a parathyroidectomy, he walks in and says, this is Ms. Mr. Jones. We're going to do a parathyroidectomy, reimplantation, uh, no allergies, beta blocker was taken today. And this is actually a checklist that we have to go through. And at the end of the case, before he leaves, he has to do what's called a debriefing. So the debriefing goes something like this. OK, I just performed a parathyroidectomy, a radical neck dissection, and the tying off of the carotid artery. It was a complicated case. Uh, and the uh, patient's going to go to the ICU, and the disposition is, is, is challenged and discussed. Well, I think that's a perfect opportunity for us to introduce what's called a surgical receipt. So that at the end of the case, instead of going and saying, because if you go to the store, and if I ask Dr. Siegel, hey, here's my credit card. Go to Whole Foods and buy your family a week of groceries. Guess what? It's going to be hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. I would like to think so, because all the great wine he's going to pick. <laughs> but if he used his own credit card, it would be a fraction of that, because he's going to pick what he needs. So how about if we pair up and align the data of what we use in surgery with what our outcomes will be. So imagine a day when Dr. Angelos does a debriefing, and without going granular, the, flat, the screen on the, on the uh, uh, dashboard flashes green, yellow, or red. Green means that he's within the norm of parathyroidectomy surgeons across the country, and the costs are right within one or two standard deviations, maybe one standard deviation. Yellow, he's, something happened, it creeps above that, and two statins were opened, and he actually used two statins, uh, and maybe that's a variability that is acceptable. But then if Dr. Angelos comes out of surgery and that screen flashes red every single case, someone's going to make a call and say, hey, Dr. Angelos, look, look I just want to show you the last 20 cases that you've done. Outcomes are good, but why is it that you cost the hospital $122,000 and uh, Dr. Grogan does it for twelve? dollars the length of stay is the same. The re uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve is always protected and it's never cut. The patient outcomes are the same. Help us understand that. So I think there's an opportunity for us to pair the debriefing with what we spend in surgery. First of all, we have to unveil what things cost because people just don't know, and including myself, what things actually cost in surgery. I'm going to talk about the ethics of that later and, and really tie it in in our discussion. But 
moving on to how things are going to be organized. We talked about price transparency. We talked about cost control on an individual basis. And I want to uh, finish up with a few things. Uh, and I think things will change on how patients are accessing our healthcare institutions. So right now, this price transparency and information velocity, I think, is going to enhance and empower patients to have greater choice. Uh, we know it as of today. I mean, you know, things like air, airline flights and uh, car services have become a commodity. And uh, I dare say it to distinguished colleagues like Dr. Sohn, but surgery, because we've gotten so good at it, may become commoditized. Uh, of course, there's individual variations of complexity and indexing, but things that we do in surgery may become commoditized, and in medicine itself. And with that, commodity and price transparency and information velocity will lead to greater patient choice. And it's happening already in virtually every other industry that we can think about. So if you make that available publicly, which is happening already, and then make cost data available, you're going to start to see that we, need to reorganize ourselves. Here's what happens right now. If a patient has breast cancer, and I'll use breast cancer because it's a very complex set of touch points with surgeons and physicians and radiologists and imaging and nurses, that we actually have something called nurse navigators that help a patient navigate through who they need to touch as far as healthcare. So there's surgery, there's oncology, there's radiation oncology, pathology. I didn't even list the six or seven others. But we all currently work in silos. We may have these things called multidisciplinary teams, but each of us is our own cost center and our own revenue center. So we are doing what we need to do to maximize rents for what we do in surgery. Oncology will do the same for oncology, radiology, and so forth. So we are basically working in silos. And the patient has to figure out how to manage these silos uh, for themselves. So what does that mean? I think it's stuck here. So Instead of having nurse navigators, they have to be their own navigators. So they have to figure out, wait, I have breast cancer. I have a breast lump. I've got to go to the University of Chicago website. Um, there's nothing that says breast diseases necessarily, but I have to figure out for myself, because my friend told me that I should probably get a, a mammogram. And then after I get a mammogram, well, the, that's going to go to the pathologist. And I have to figure out and make sure I talk to Dr. Hussein to make sure all the margins and what type of tumor that I have. Then after that, I have to be aware enough, if the navigator is off for the day, to figure out that I need a surgeon. And I need to go talk to Dr. Jaskowiak. And then upon that, you have to, the patient has to figure out, well, I may need chemo. I may need reconstruction. And this is all the onus is on the patient. Now, if you back up to the last slide I showed you, because of information, price transparency, cost control that I believe is going to happen, uh, that is going to be open to the public. So we have to organize ourselves better. And what I think is going to happen, and I think what should happen, is we should be organized as disease-based and uh, forward-thinking institutions where a patient will understand that if they have a disease of the breast or breast cancer, that they click breast cancer and all our providers, and I hate to use the word provider because as a physician, I didn't go to provider school. I went to medical school. But this is how third-party payers think about us. And this is how the, per the public may think about us. This is how we're going to be organized. And I think this is how we should be organized. Some may say, hey, we are organized that way. Some may say that the Cleveland Clinic is doing it because a website shows it that way. But I can tell you that unless you pair up cost centers and revenue centers that way, instead of the current way we're doing it within silos, it really doesn't work that way. Where the money is is how we should be organized. And where the money is how we're going to have to be organized. So what does that mean? So right now, if you came to the University of Chicago, these are rough, rough, rough estimates. These are make-believe numbers. This is what you're gonna, a patient's going to pay. But in the future, with bundled care at the University of Chicago, Blue Cross Blue Shield or Walmart, or McDonald's will say, you know, for Ms. Jones, we're going to give you $33,000. And you guys figure out how you're going to be organized and how you're going to dole up that money. Because now the risk is on you guys, and that's what's going to happen. So I think what needs to happen, that cost centers will have to be blended. Uh, the bundle care concept will be the norm. And a single payment to the, to the hospital system or the ACO will have to be uh, what's, what we have to manage per member, per month type of uh, a, a payment model may be the norm. Who knows? But that's what's going to happen, in my opinion. 
And then for the hospital, it's, it's going to be an overall break-even game instead of a profit margin because right now the reason why we can do all these things is that certain payers will pay us 20x of what other payers will pay us. And that's how we cross-subsidize. So in the era of bundled payments, we're really going to have to be efficient and manage our costs because revenues will, will slump. Um, and then because of that, I think we can make that up by doing more efficient, expeditious quality care. Because the more you do, the better at it you get and the more efficient you get. I mean, when I used to do a DIEP flat for breast reconstruction 10 years ago, it took me 12 hours to do it. Today, I did one a couple days ago, it takes me about four and a half. So it is possible to do more, to do better, and my outcomes, I think, are better than they were 10 years ago. And then finally, the, the whole concept of who pays for the complication. So if someone has a breast cancer complication after touch points of all these different services, then who pays for it? Well, I think that the risk will be shifted on us as well as the provider, as the institution. Because now the insurance companies and the self-insured companies will say, whoa, 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 we gave you $33,000 for patient X. That's what we're going to give you. And we have to figure out how to manage ourselves better. So what will the departments of the future look like? Well, these are just my made up uh, names, but it may be a department of breast diseases where the cost centers and the management is all within that department of breast services. The chair may be a breast surgeon, the faculty may be a plastic surgeon, radiologist, and an oncologist and pathologist, all revolving around breast diseases. A lot of this is happening in Europe as we speak. Heart and vascular diseases, the chair may be your cardiologist with all these people as faculty members. Right now, it, they communicate and they have multidisciplinary teams, but we're not under the same cost center. Department of Trauma and Extremity Care and so forth. You can start to see that uh, if you think about patient forward ways of delivering efficient, quality, valued health care, we're going to have to change as physicians and as leaders, uh, particularly in surgery. So I believe change is inev inevitable. The current fog of confusion uh, is dissipating and uh, it'll continue to clear up. Uh, we're going to have to cross that crevasse to this value-based healthcare side, and it's going to be expedited by risking, uh, transferring risk to providers and institutions. Um, it's going to be an incentive to manage our population and our zip code as opposed to a fee-for-service model. Insurance exchanges will insure more people, uh, but reimbursements will be lower. So let me stop for a moment and talk about the ethics of how this may plan out if you think about what's happened in Canada and in the UK, there will be some sort of rationing. And it's, ooh, it's a bad word. Rationing of healthcare is a really bad word here in the United States. But these are the vehicles that are going to help implement that rationing if it's called rationing. It may be called a wait list or it may be called uh, you know, a, a uh, to be continued type of list. But healthcare will be rationed. Price transparency, I believe, is going to be the norm because it's happening already. Patients will be able to click online and know Dr. Song costs X, Dr. Angelos costs 2X, and Dr. Siegler costs half X, and we'll be able to choose and pair that with, with quality data. Uh, outcome measures will be front and center. We have NISQIP right now. We have all types of uh, data that's available for institutions, a SEER database, but there will be databases that are forward facing like Yelp or Angie's List or Castlight will have that vehicle for you to go on there and say, well, Dr. Siegler did 3,000 left toe surgeries last year, and his infection, surgical site infection rate was 0.2%. Meanwhile, Dr. Chin did 2,200, and his infection rate was 5%. By the way, Dr. Siegler costs half X. So I think you're going to start to see that paired up with patient-facing data. Cost control on an individual basis, I believe, will be the norm. And within our lifetime, within our era in practicing surgery here at the University of Chicago, Jason will have a way of figuring out how to pair that data with what we do. It's very unsavory to think about, but it has to be the case for us to continue to make a margin to fuel our mission. And then opportunities. I think opportunities and feedback for individual growth and improvement will make us better, faster, stronger, and uh, it's all about performance enhancement. So. Uh, let me take the next few minutes to talk about some of the cool things, because I hate to always end on a downer. I mean, I give these talks at our major international societies and our national societies, and literally I see the surgeons in the room, their faces turning red, 
they're about to hurl their leftover sandwich at me. And I have to remind them I'm, I'm just the messenger and these are just my thoughts. And, and I, quite frankly, one of the things I actually put up there is, as a disclaimer, I hope I'm wrong. I, I never like to be wrong, but in this instance, I would love to be invited back five years from now to the McLean Center and say, ooh, I would love to eat crow up here and say, my title will be, how wrong was I? We're still in the fee-for-service model. In fact, we've gone back to the fee-for-service model and insurance payments are, you know, Obamacare's repealed and things are not just back to old business, but you know, the good old days. I don't think that's gonna happen, but I would love to be invited back if that does, and I'd be the first one to say, how wrong was I? But I have to remind myself that, that surgery and surgeons um, in particular, and I'm, I'm safe to say this because I am a surgeon, it's hard to change what we do because safety revolves around repetition and how we were taught and how our mentors were taught and so forth. And so to try to break that culture uh, is very challenging, especially in surgery. So I do want to end on a high note. So opportunities. So if you think about what we do in, in sports and even in video games, there's all kinds of sensors that allow you to be better at what you do. Who play, uh, how many golfers in this room? All right. If you've ever hooked yourself up to a swing machine, you'll understand that what you do. This is a horrible golf swing. Notice my head is <laughs> dipping down. There's a little sway in what I do. And my hips are not rotating, but they're swaying. This is after multiple attempts at sensors and speed and this and that and the other. But I thought to myself, wait a minute, I'm doing this for my golf game. Why not do this to my profession? So let's show you a great swing. <laughs> this is Tiger Woods. And you can see that his head doesn't move. This is not digitally enhanced. It's unbelievable because he doesn't move, his head doesn't move at all. He's rotating around the core of what he does. This has relevance. Bear with me. <laughs> this definitely has relevance. And you can see that at the top of his swing, his club is parallel to the ground and pointed in the right direction. And look at what happens when he releases. Head doesn't move at all. There's no sway in the hips. It's an uncoiling of power. Boom, 320 yards, straight down the middle. Now what if I told you that that was his swing in 2005 and he's changed it three times since? three times, and that's Tiger Woods. Because as a professional, as what he does and what he wants to achieve uh, before his fateful accident and by his wife, uh, <laughs> ex-wife, is as a professional, what he wants to do is become better. And he's changed his swing since then three times. So what are some of the opportunities? What can we do? This is courtesy of Philippe. This is what we're doing right now under uh, Dr. Langerman's guidance in OPRI, Opera Performance Research Institute, to make sure that we can apply some of the things that we used to fix my golf swing, which is, which is uh, beyond repair, to do things in surgery better, faster, more efficiently, safely, and the economies of motion of what we're, I'm gonna show you a slide here. This is a 3D rendering of what our posture looks like. That's me right there. It's my assistant. How can we organize ourselves better as a team to, to, for a greater outcome, greater patient comfort, greater surgeon comfort? And here's some of the things that we can do. This is uh, Sam Fuller. I, I, he's not here today, but uh, I think I have his permission to show his image. This is me. Look at his neck. His neck is bent and flexed for hours on end. And if you've ever spoken to a surgeon that's 50 years old or more, they invariably have cervical neck or lumbar problems. Maybe not Peter, but I can tell you most of my colleagues in plastic surgery, because we wear loops, we wear headlights, by the time we're in our late 40s, early 50s, at the prime of our career, we've got problems. And so how can we fix that? Because if you're operating like this and you're uncomfortable and you're doing a microanastomosis uh, of a 1.2 millimeter vessel, well, I think you're gonna be better if you're like this and more comfortable and relaxed. So how can we improve ourselves? It's a matter of, first of all, getting the data, becoming more efficient, understanding what we're using in the operating room to then translate into better outcomes. 
So how does that work? Atul Gawande talked about a surgical coach, and that's a fine idea, but it's, um, it's not necessary. I can't hire Butch Harmon or Tiger Woods coach, swing coach. I would, I would love to. Uh, and have them see me every time. But what we can do is leverage our technology. We can watch film for immediate feedback, real-time improvements to say, and using sensors to say, hey, wait a minute, Dr. Siegler, you're bent over too much, or your neck is crooked, and if you continue to do that, you're going to get cervical neck disc herniation. It's, we got to be more ergonomic and more efficient. Uh, I believe this will translate into patient safety, because as a surgeon, if I'm operating for eight hours and I'm not comfortable, I know at the end of the case that I could have done something better. And I think if, as surgeons in the room, if we're all honest with ourselves, if we're comfortable and stress-free as much as humanly possible, then things will be efficient, things will be safer, and things will be more cost-effective. So it also adds to surgeon safety. And uh, I'll end with a real-life example of this. There's a, a very famous plastic surgeon who's a hand surgeon that at two years ago he gave this keynote address to our society and the first slide he showed was um, it looked like the uh, an x-ray of someone that was 90 years old with degenerative joints there's no actually joint spaces at all in, his, in this patient's neck and spine and the next slide is it showed that it was himself it was a c-spine of himself he's practicing and living with chronic pain because of the things that we did, he didn't do early on in his career. So for those young surgeons in the room and for those not so young surgeons in the room, we have to be more efficient. We have to think ergonomically of what we're doing because I believe it, it translates into patient safety and our safety. So a new dawn is upon us. I think there's a lot of opportunities. There's an incredible change. And the velocity of that change, even within my lifetime as a physician, has, is, is like at 120 miles an hour. Uh, and it's going to get faster. And we have to be responsive to that uh, and partner with our, our, our hospital partners and with each other to be better. And uh, I want to leave you with this slide. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a, a wonderful presentation. And it happens to fall in line with um, what happens as we develop an integrated care system which is now labeled uh, uh, accountable care organization. It smacks of um, heresy in an academic medical center that is set up in academic departments who have traditionally been very strong. And um, um, my question has to do with how are we going to um, de-emphasize academic departments and develop uh, accountable care um, along the way with your with your price transparency and value structure, all of which I think are very important. Uh, Cleveland Clinic has done it; they've virtually eliminated the traditional department, um, setting everything up by service lines. But how do we go about doing that here with, uh, at a place that has a culture? of um, working in silos without very much horizontal integration to begin with? Yeah, that's a great question. First and foremost, we're not alone. If you look at any University of St. Elsewhere Academic Medical Center, it's very much built upon departmental prominence, departmental uh, profitability. Um, departments are lauded for uh, you know research dollars and profitability. So it's a culture that I think has to change, and it, unfortunately, it will change because of how healthcare is changing. Uh, Cleveland Clinic has is the forefront of this, and they're really the leaders of this. But even to, to this day, Cleveland Clinic, their cost structures and their revenue centers are not blended. Um, some of their programs are, and they're moving that way. But this is a real shift. And you know, you want to call me a heretic? Believe me, I've been called a lot worse for giving this, this talk because it, it is something that if you divorce yourself as a surgeon and look at it purely from a uh, perspective of service, uh, of service uh, as a business, um, it's, this model that we currently live in is, is archaic. And I think that the public's going to demand more. Uh, the price transparency and cross structure is going to mandate it. And I think that we have to respond. So um, 
the change is going to be very difficult. And I think there's still a sweet spot. I think there's a way to be able to reorganize our departments, blending our cost structure without sacrificing the research and the, and the educational mission. There's definitely a way. We just need to figure out. I mean, we, we can figure out how to transplant a kidney and transplant a lung. We can easily figure out how to reorganize ourselves. It's just a matter of coming to the table, having very frank discussions, and figuring out the win-wins, uh, particularly as it pertains to patient care. I think when we do that and we sort of check our egos at the door and think about what's right in this new environment, we will find win-wins that will give us greater prominence uh, and not necessarily just departmental prominence. So uh, that's hopefully my prediction and I'd like to be right on that one because uh, you know there are many institutions that we know of where the department of left toe surgery is extremely prominent internationally and yet uh, the departments of medicine or surgery are not. And so if we can reorganize ourselves better uh, to be more efficient and to, be, uh, to deliver that care in a more cost effective way, there will be room for that margin to help feed the missions that make us what we are. Um, so two quick questions. One, it, it seems to me that bundling payments actually incentivizes the physician to do the least amount possible at potential risk for the patient, um, which I'm not sure is an ideal situation for us to get into, too, so I wonder if you could comment on that. And then the other is, um, do you suppose the expansion of insurance to folks on the south side might change the university's calculation that providing trauma care is not financially feasible? Yeah, um, let me focus on the fact that bundle care may actually expedite a two-tiered system of health care. It's happening already. It's ha if you look uh, uh, north of our borders, if you look at the UK, any place with somewhat of this nationalized system has a two-tiered health system. So um, you're, you're, the answer to your question is yes and no. I think uh, yes, it will help to ration, if that's the word, uh, healthcare. So I w I'll give you an a, a example of what I mean by that. I was, so right now, we at the University of Chicago are trying to do everything humanly possible to increase patient flow, uh, particularly in breast reconstruction, let's say. Well, I went to Vancouver as a visiting professor, and their biggest problem, believe it or not, is they have too many patients. Their average wait time for an elective breast reconstruction was eight months. So they're trying to figure out how to stop the doors. Um, so it's completely flip-flop. So what has happened in Vancouver is there are these private clinics that cater to people with means. Um, and I don't say this with any judgment at all. I just want to tell you what's happening is the, a two-tiered system will evolve and it continues to be involved. If you look at the data on primary care physicians, the average, the number of uh, primary care physicians with a concierge practice 10 years ago was 3%. Now I think it's like 13 or 14 percent and rapidly rising. There's a whole group, uh, an organization like the AMA calling, you know, American Primary Care Concierge Physicians uh, Association or something like that. And that's rapidly increasing. So you're starting to see a lot of that play out. Um, as far as, you know, care, I mean, that, that trauma discussion is, is, is probably not relevant to th this, this talk. Um, but I think that you're, you're going to start to see that academic medical centers will start to expand their focuses of what we can do more efficiently and better. What is the future of the telemedicine, pro and cons, cost effectiveness? Yeah, so the future of telemedicine. So, you know, we have to define what telemedicine really means. Um, does it mean individualized patient interaction? Does it mean um, feeds to teach? Does it mean a combination of both? Uh, so I think that's already happening now. I mean, webinars are the norm. You know, our conferences are, uh, you know, closed, you know, through the internet being broadcast to all the people that want to subscribe. Um, I think that meetings of the future are going to be more uh, based on internet and web-based as opposed to actual sitting down and shaking hands. So it's happening already. <clears throat> you know, there's companies right now that are, especially in aesthetic medicine, that are, um, doing consults via Skype and closed uh, circuit type of uh, services. And so it's happening already. It's just a matter of how do we keep it safe, how do we keep it compliant, and how do we make sure that uh, patients really are getting what they're, what they're asking for. So 
to answer your question, it's happening already. Uh, I think a, a huge educational agenda of mine as the Associate Dean for CME is trying to leverage that whole learning online and personal uh, professional management and growth. So that's happening already. Thank you for a superb talk. That was excellent. The question that I have is you started to talk about the um, catch-22 of cost containment. If you do more, you make more. If you do less, you make less. I have control as a surgeon over my cost. I can send a bill in. I have control over it. I have no control over the hospital costs. I have no control over the pharmaceutical costs. I have no control over the device costs. And it seems to me, and I'd like to get your suggestion, of how we could have more impact on the hospitals, pharmaceutical companies, device companies to all work together to get those costs under control. You know, I think it starts with um, really leveraging transparency and understanding that that's right around the corner. And so, you know, imagine if you find a equivalent to a Jason at your hospital and you sit down and say, look, let's figure out how we as an organization can do things more efficiently, more cost effectively with better outcomes. Well, I showed you my own personal slide of how much money I'm wasting. And I think if I walked into your operating room at the end of the case, you'll start to realize, oh my gosh, I didn't realize my nurse opened up five of those you know, uh, urethral catheters. And I think that, that starts there. And if you align goals with the institution, well, that margin that you either save uh, can be deployed for everyone's benefit. So I think it starts with partnership. And that's one of my summary slides is to, to make sure that we, I mean, Let's face it, in, the, in this new era, we have to have partnerships. You're seeing massive consolidations in healthcare as we speak. You know, Cadence Healthcare aligning now with Northwestern and all these different healthcare systems aligning. Why? Because they're trying to gain more economies of scale uh, for everything that they do. And so we have to do that on an individual basis. And I think there's huge opportunities for us to do that. So I would start there. And I would start involvement with, you know, I think Jason and I talk probably uh, more than most surgeons and, and administrators talk on the hospital side. And I think there's, there's that type of dialogue can be dramatically improved and the volume turned up a little bit. How could we, last, how could we impact on the device companies and pharmaceutical? Big article today, hepatitis C. They have a drug now that costs $84,000 right. for treatment. Well, how many people can afford that? And how many of these devices can we afford to use you know, under cost containment? I was wondering if you have any ideas of how we can impact on device companies and pharmaceutical companies. Which yeah, so, I, you we're know, not saying we're not going to use them. Right. So, um, this is slightly off topic, but I can talk to you. I, I'm uh, the, the vice president and treasurer of our society. One of the things that we're creating for the American Society of Plastic Surgeons is an entire uh, medical service organization and GPOs. So we are pooling risk and we are pooling uh, negotiating power across multiple different individual practitioners to say that if you need a stapler or a widget, uh, that we're going to go and negotiate en masse, not just one surgeon or a group of surgeons, but 4,000 surgeons to the companies. And boy, believe me, if you're Johnson & Johnson and 4,000 surgeons come up to you and they're 80% of your business, they're going to listen, as opposed to four surgeons come up to you and say, hey, you're basically relegated to talking with the, with the rep. So there's opportunities for us and I think for you in our organizations to, to think about uh, on mass or uh, you know negotiations with with device companies and with pharmaceutical companies and I think imagine if the you know if uh, all the the uh, hepatologists in the country got together and said look you know we're we're going to use your drug but now we've got 22,500 hepatologists that want to use your drug we can't pay eighty four thousand dollars but here's what we're going to pay we're going to pay eight thousand three hundred twenty two dollars guess what that company is going to say. So I think there's power in organizations. Um, I, sound like, I sound like a labor union guy, but, <laughs> but uh, you know, I think that, uh, that we have to understand and leverage that we are not alone and the era of individual practitioners is long gone. And I took out a slide because I thought I'd run out of time, but there's data showing that in 2008, 71% of all physicians in the country, 71% were somehow employed by a hospital system. Now it's probably about 78% and eventually the, the, the era of the individual practitioner is uh, probably over for these reasons. 
it, that was a really great talk, so thank you very much. Just a, a question um, for you, and I'd love your, your thoughts on it. I was recently visiting a professor in Massachusetts, so what they're very concerned about is the tiering of medical centers. So medical centers are placed into tiers, and depending on what tier they are, patients are told you can go to you know, whatever hospital you want, but if you go to tier one, you pay this deductible. If you go to tier two, you pay a greater deductible. And most of the academic medical centers are at the higher tier because the cost of providing care in an academic institution is often much higher. And so I'm wondering your thoughts about that. Is that what we're going to see nationally? And if so, how as surgeons can we address that since I personally have little role to play in what tier we might be? That's a great question. So uh, recently, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal looking at um, either Forbes or Wall Street Journal looking at uh, how Texas, even Texas, which is almost like a different country, how they're organizing their networks. So MD Anderson used to be in everyone's network in Texas. Now I think they're only a part of 13. And that's MD Anderson. So it's happening as we speak. And they're, um, you know, they're, they're trying to strategize this, this, trying to answer the question that, that you just posed. I don't know what the right answer is. I think that what we have to do is to think creatively. So you can imagine uh, University of Chicago having partners that are not necessarily under one federal tax ID number, perhaps. Uh, and I'm just making this up. But uh, those are ways that we can capture patients, um, leverage this highly specialized quaternary care, at the same time, somehow fit into some network. And I think people are thinking about that creatively as we speak. Um, but I think that's got to be the answer. And I, and I know people in Emily Anderson are, are also thinking on that level as to how to, uh, to grow their roots without growing their cost structure. David, thanks so much. What do you think the impact of this new system will be on surgical innovation and surgical advances? That's, boy, that is such I have a whole nother talk, Mark, on, on, on that particular, yeah, I do. And uh, so here's what I think. I think that coupled with what's happening on, on the healthcare national landscape, with the fact that the FDA has become a barrier in many ways, you're starting to see a lot of clinical and human trials and device makers go abroad. You know, there's multinational companies. So, um, so some of the things that I've done in clinical trials are now, we used to do them here in the States, and we used to have our own animal labs. What they're doing now is they're innovating in Costa Rica because they have access to old world primates and no FDA. So then they're getting a CE approval before they get the FDA approval. That's what's going to happen. It's happening right now as we speak in uh, you know, hotbeds like India, uh, where cost structure is so low and the FDA really doesn't exist. And, you know, uh, on the nefarious side of things, if you want to look at it the, through that lens, there's no IRB or, or Helsinki doctrine of human you know, experimentation is probably a little loose there as opposed to we are here. We're probably on the other end of the pendulum. So I think you're going to start to see innovation occur outside of the United States. And the hegemony of surgical innovation that was always our purview uh, may, may be slowly slipping away. Now having said that, things like OPRI and what Alex is doing on an innovation level on a different side of, of being efficient, uh, cost effective, and it, it's a whole nother field of discovery. I think we're, we're well poised to take advantage of that. Thanks, Dr. Song. That was, uh, I really enjoyed that talk. Um, so you mentioned the debrief as a way to give feedback to surgeons as, as, and, you know, as one of probably many ideas that could be used to change the culture of a surgery department. But then you mentioned the role of an academic center in taking initiative in this new possible era of bundled payments, um, trying, to incent trying to align um, surgeons to understand the costs of their operations, what they do. Um, but there are debrief costs that come with having residents in the OR and trainees in the OR, such as increased time, maybe increased resources. Um, but eventually, the responsibility of that surgery falls to the attending surgeon. So for me as a trainee and for my classmates, how do you reconcile the initiative that an academic center needs to take with all these changes and the role an academic center has to train doctors? Yeah. 
couple that with the 80 hour work week, it becomes more of a challenge. I was recently the program director for plastic surgery and, until I fired myself for Julie Park. Uh, you know, it's a challenge. It's, it's, it's a greater challenge today than ever before to train residents. We're limited in, what, in how many hours we, we have them for. Uh, you know, there's a greater burden placed on people like Peter and I to do more of the things that residents used to do. Um, you know, and so it, it becomes an incredible challenge to train residents. Uh, now the benefit is I didn't have 3D virtual imaging 12 years ago, right? So I think you're going to start to see an uptick in simulation. I think you're going to start to see an uptick in virtual surgery and planning. Uh, our, our conferences are more robust than ever before. Um, so that may ne not necessarily replace surgical training, but I'm afraid of that too. I mean, this is what I talk about on our board level is we're starting to see a generation of surgeons that have been trained under the 80 hour work week. And I will say, uh, and this is not necessarily backed up by evidence, but a lot of my peers will say that, wow, these weren't the same type of products that we were producing 15 years ago. You know, people talk about that 10,000 hour rule to become an expert. Uh, and we're slicing away on both ends. And uh, so it, it becomes harder and harder as a trainee. So what I tell my residents is before the risk was on us to teach you how to operate because we had no regulations. You can stay here 140 hours a week. Now the risk is on you to make sure you get that knowledge. And so uh, from day one, one of the things that I tell my residents is look, we have only six years and 20% less t hours to train you with, uh, you've got to figure out how to supplement that by being present always, by asking the hard questions, by being more efficient in the way you absorb knowledge. You know, here's a great example of how efficient people can be. Uh, when I trained, you know, email was just starting to come about. I mean, if, I, if Dr. Siegel asked me a question on rounds, I better have remembered it. Um, or I'd have to go to Karar and look it up in the stacks after rounds and figure out what the answer was. Nowadays, you ask a medical student and they'll correct you and they'll say, well, Dr. Song, the article that you wrote in 2008 actually says this on Google. <laughs> so, you know, that time sink of what I had to do to train myself is gone. So perhaps that is a way to become more efficient in how we train our residents. And that's the only way to do it because you're right, because we're, you know, Peter and I and Alex were, were forced to do a lot of things that I never, uh, you know, that I used to do as a resident. I mean, my pager goes off probably just as much as the intern some days. Uh, and that's just the way it is. And we can, you know, moan about it all we want, or we can decide to figure out how to make that more efficient and better for our residents. So um, it's a great time to train as a resident because of all this technology. I think the opportunity and the risk is now on you to say, look, I own my six years of residency in plastic surgery. I better figure out how to turn out at the end of this journey a proficient surgeon. Whereas it was almost de facto that you did back in the old days. Thanks. One of the takeaways I had was that planning is really important and just tearing out of uh, Gawande's page, out of his book, Experience, Judgment, Planning. It seems like um, some of the themes that you've thrown out that, that planning is deficient and we need more information. Aside from information sharing between EMRs, what are the implications for better, stronger, earlier evidence-based patient assessment and review, and better clinical decision making at the front end as, as, as before you decide to yeah. operate on a patient? Great question. So uh, I'm going to give you another story. This is, uh, is Russell Reed here in the room? So Russell Reed is our craniofacial surgeon. Uh, when he takes care of kids that are born with misshapen heads and he does a big operation called cranial vault surgery where with a neurosurgeon he peels back the scalp, basically takes the bone off, rearranges it and puts it back on. And the planning of surgery was done uh, because of the knowledge. You sat with a guy that used to do it for 30 years and that's how you train. Uh, so about five years ago there's a company in Colorado where you can actually send the CT scan to and they'll give you a model of it so you can actually do the model surgery before you walked into surgery. Now, Dr. Reed just bought a 3D printer last year and he does it himself. So before every vault case, he prints out on the 3D printer a model of the patient's skull. Sits down with the resident and plans out the cuts. Gets even better. There's a company that allows you 
to, with 3D imaging and with the rendering of the after result, it can give you cutting guides. So the cutting guides are sterilizable. You put it right on the bone. <clears throat> I mean, even I can do it. You just saw right where it says one, two, and three. It's like paint by numbers, and the, simu and the results are better than before, than just using your eye. So uh, the simulation part of what we're talking about, and this is intuitive. I don't know if you're a physician or a surgeon, but this is intuitive to the new generation of residents. I mean, for me, it's kind of like, wow, that's cool. And they're like, what are you talking about? I got a 3D printed at home, you know? And so um, it goes back to sort of the question that he asked, how are the residents going to get better? So the planning stage, before it used to be ready, shoot, aim. Now it's aim, 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 ready, and then shoot maybe half a bullet. And I think that's what's happening with surgery. That's clearly what's going to be happening with medicine because of these, the EMR is going to accelerate that. And I think that I'm seeing that in real time in surgery right now with my own division going from CT scan and sort of eyeballing it to then sending the CT scan to a company to have them send it back to us for model surgery that cost 3,000 bucks that the patient had to pay for to then now we have a CD, 3D printer to then we send that 3D printer with these cutting guides and now we can, anyone can do the surgery. It's fascinating. I want to thank you for a wonderful talk. It's absolutely fabulous. Um, as surgeons, we're trained to um, take care of patients, and uh, we own our patients. Um, and sometimes, to a fault, uh, we take care of our patients and keep going full throttle to the last breathing moment. But the American Board of Surgery now sponsors fellowships in palliative medicine. Uh, as surgical services, we tend not to refer to palliative medicine because it's counterintuitive to us the way we were trained and it's giving up. But sometimes the 93-year-old with aortic stenosis doesn't need a valve replacement, just needs comfort care. And the head neck patient, cancer patient who's demented in a nursing home doesn't need a radical neck, he just needs comfort care. When in surgery will the pendulum begin to sh shift for us, thinking about palliation is not giving up, but actually honoring patients' preferences and understanding that this, some of the things that we do are not necessarily indicated just because we can do them. So, who passed away last year uh, was one of my professors in business school. He gave a talk uh, two years ago, and his data showed that about 85% of our GDP in healthcare spend is spent within the last five years of life. So I wouldn't be here talking about this if we as a society could figure out how to diminish that. This is why uh, President Obama talks about South Korea as being a model healthcare system. I'll tell you why it works there, because it's one culture, one people. You can sway social norms by a mini-series that, you, you know, that the government says, hey, I want you to make a mini-series on end-of-life care, make it attractive to die at home. So when you go, when the 92-year-old goes to Azan Medical Center with aortic stenosis, the surgeon will say, hey, Mr. Kim, in a, not, a lot more blunt way, look, you're 92, you had a great life, why don't you go home and die? It sounds a little bit better in Korean, but basically that's what happens. Uh, you try telling that to Mr. Jones up the street, you're 92, and, and the family says, no, we want great, great granddaddy to have that surgery uh, and to come out alive and, and to make it to 100. So once again, I wouldn't even be given this talk. We wouldn't even have this whole series on the ethics of Affordable Care Act if we as a society could somehow figure out how to curb 85% of our healthcare costs in the last five years of our life. I don't know how to do that. And this is an ethical question that probably Dr. Siegler has been thinking about for years. I mean, we have a disparate society. We've got, and this is what makes us great, and this is what makes us, in my opinion, weak at the same time, because we've got, my best friend is Muslim, and my you know, wife may be Christian, and my sons may be a fundamental you know, uh, Jane. And we have all different norms of what's right and what's wrong, and we have to respect that. And that truly is what makes our country so great. But then we pay for it on the end of life care. I mean, who dies at home anymore? Nobody. They die on your operating table uh, because you've tried to do, redo, redo that aortic stenosis on a 99-year-old. So, boy, I, if you can figure that out, we would obviate, and then we can go back to innovation and think about, you know, really cool stuff. Maybe some of your residents should get on palliative medicine service before they finish. Right, and but you know, once again, we could we could really titch up 
palliative medicine to a whole nother residency, if you will, but that doesn't change social norms. You know, within one small zip code, you've got variabilities of what end of life means. You know, in South Korea, it's really sort of one norm. I mean, it's almost shunned when you take your great grandfather to the hospital for a 93, 93 year old great grandfather for aortic stenosis. They wouldn't even go to the hospital. The doctor would come and say, you know, yeah, he's got aortic stenosis. Let's make him comfortable and die at home. And that's honored and that's respected and that's the norm. Here, it's completely flip-flop. So we could do all kinds of palliative care residencies and fellowships and what have you, but until we change, if we ever change, our societal norms, we're never gonna get there. And it really goes back to what Fogel talked about. The, if we really wanna decrease 18% of our GDP to you know, somewhere in the 11% range amongst our peer nations, we're doing it the wrong way. The biggest lever is to figure out how to fix the end of, end of life care. So David, you talked about the challenge of, of changing the way that different departments or groups are organized or relate to one another. And I wonder if you could put on both your business hat as well as your ethics hat. And if you think, first of all, bundled payments, you have that picture of the dollar bill and how the dollars are currently divided, but think about what kind of criteria or process you would use to figure out how that dollar should be divided up among a new really organized system as well as, I guess, sort of related, but if you take the broader population perspective, so ACOs, for example, where it's not just a bundled payment, but then you have potentially a, a fixed capitated budget, how you do that same process about deciding about preventive care and population management. So what type of criteria and process would you use given the difficulty of buy-in and change? Yeah, you know, I'd give 100% to the surgeons, and so this one, <laughs> uh, you know, this is a, it's a really great question, and I think that we'll have to have better metrics. Uh, I introduced a new concept of relative cost units. I think we have to think about that. We have RVUs, you have RVUs, Dr. Siegler and I have RVUs, it's accepted. Uh, whether we think the methodology is right or wrong, it's accepted. I think we have to figure out a relative cost unit because we can't think about revenue without thinking about expenses and the bottom line income statement has to balance that out. So that's the business side of me talking. There has to be some sort of way to measure effort, cost, and then ultimately the bottom line. So uh, it's going to be formulaic, and you know this is going to be heresy. But I think surgeons are probably going to come down. Uh, the primary care physicians probably should go up. Uh, preventive care physicians and organizations should be subsidized by what we do because then it prevents some of the things that are happening. Uh, and in the mix, there's going to be once again this two-tiered system where people are just going to bypass all that and say. I'm 93 and I want my third aortic, aortic valve replacement. That's always going to happen. This is America. There's, you know, I was approached by a private equity firm to think about creating a <clears throat> top end hospital in uh, the Bahamas, away from all this where, you know, Peter Angelos, we would hire him for three months if, the, if Jeff Matthews let him to come down there and operate for two and, and see his patients for the third month with his, with his family. Patients fly down. How awesome would that be? They fly down to the Bahamas, get their thyroid taken out, and make sure that they're all healed. They go home. Peter makes six times what he does, and then comes back and still becomes a professor of surgery and runs the ethics and so forth. And that will happen. Um, but you know, how do we bundle and how do we divvy up that dollar that's diminishing? I think there has to be a transparent metho methodology that uh, everyone can recognize and appreciate and respect and call it relative cost units, call it whatever you will, but we have to create a mirrored system along with RVUs to do that. David, you sounded pessimistic in your talk about the future of the surgeon-patient relationship. Is there a future for it? Oh, absolutely, and, I, and let me be clear, uh, this is not necessarily pessimism, it's just the realities of what, I, what I'm seeing and what I'm hearing. I've been given this talk and very interested in this for the past four years. In my opinion, the opportunities are in outcomes and enhancing that patient-surgeon relationship because that's where value is created. So whether that's expressed through a second tier system or whether that's expressed through the current system, that has to be the norm because patients are gonna demand it and it's gonna be transparent. It's gonna, you know, you can go to health grades, which is not very good because it's all patient reported and it could be bogus, but there will be measures and there's gonna be a, a Yelp or a Angie's List type of thing that pairs 
your surgical site infection data or your outcome data or your length of stay data or your, you know, uh, your, your complexity index with your pa doctor patient satisfaction and a metric of that. So it behooves us as surgeons in particular, and I say this because I am one once again, that we need to enhance that relationship on a much broader scale that's enriched leveraging things like perhaps telemedicine. I mean, all my patients get my cell phone and my email. That's unheard of, right? People think I'm nuts and my wife hates it. But you know, that's, that's how you provide value and quality of healthcare in this very confusing state that we're in right now. So uh, yeah, please don't uh, misinterpret that pessimism is not necessarily pessimism. It's just what I'm seeing from a different lens that, that, uh, that was built around business school uh, but the realities of what we see now are tremendous opportunities for physicians to enhance that. Hey, following up on Dr. Seymour's question, you said that you'd be delighted if five years from now you could come back and give a talk and say, well, I was totally wrong with, with you know, my talk now. But a lot of what you've talked about sounds pretty good. I mean, value, transparency, uh, honesty, um, efficiency, emphasis on outcomes. So what are the parts of the current system that you're afraid we're going to lose? And, what are the parts of this future vision you, you talked about that you're afraid of? So when I say that I wish I could come back and say I was wrong, I think I'm speaking mostly to the surgeons in the room because there are going to be clear winners and losers. It's a, it's a zero sum game of healthcare dollars that are actually shrinking. So something's got to give. And I think the days where you know, cardiac surgeons were making $2 million, I mean, those days are, are, are long gone. So. Uh, that was the audience that I was speaking to. Now, having said that, there is this ethic, and I sort of brought it up uh, sotto voce in one of my slides, but there is this whole side of rationing healthcare that's gonna be upon us. You can call it whatever you want, but it's still gonna be rationed. It's gonna be like Canada and Vancouver where someone waits eight months for their care. And people with means, are gonna be able to come down to the University of Chicago and get it done. People without are gonna have to wait eight months. Uh, if you remember a few years ago, the Prime Minister of Canada came actually to the Mayo Clinic for her, his mother came to the Mayo Clinic for her health care as opposed to staying in Canada and waiting eight months. So when I'm saying that's, that I hope I'm wrong is right now, if you have insurance and even if you don't, you have access to health care virtually immediately. I mean the speed from, even if you're indigent and don't have insurance, uh, we have some of the best health care for indigents in the world, in our county system and our, even our patients that we treat here. And that access probably will be titrated down a little bit. So, so there's two groups of people that I'm talking to uh, in particular when I say, boy, I hope I'm wrong. Because there are a lot of barriers to, to patient care that are going to be a, ahead of us because of this. Um, there's a lot of good. And let me, let me be clear on, on one final statement is I think 50 years from now, uh, sociologists and historians will look back and say this was a wonderful thing. Uh, Affordable Care Act and what President Obama did was uh, historic and was something that was long overdue for this country. Now in the process, it's pain. There's a lot of change and change management is very difficult. Uh, and there's norms and there's, you know, there's the far right who thinks that, you know, uh, I showed you that picture. And that's from one of the Republican, you know, uh, websites. Uh, so I think we have to figure out how this is going to play out. But for the short term run, I think, once again, the surgeons in the room, we're probably at the brunt or the tip of the spear as far as change goes. And that tip can be bent in multiple different ways. So let's thank Dr. Sung for a terrific, thoughtful talk.